turn in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 2. 1 Corinthians chapter 2. We started going through the book of 1 Corinthians two weeks ago. I do this about every 10 years, going through the book of 1 Corinthians. Very, very important. It was a church that was full of problems, a great number of problems. It is interesting in light, especially of the problems that were there, he didn't suggest that they go out and start a new church. He told them to get right. Amen. Now, that's, the, that's really the way to have a new church, is if the old church just gets right with God. And so he deals with them about a number of things. We're going to read a few verses in chapter 2 to get us started. And then the Lord willing, we're going, to, um, we're going to preach on the entire chapter tonight. And before we are done tonight, I, will, I need to be reminded that we are having a brief business meeting. Okay, so verse 1. And I, brethren, when I came to you, came not with excellency of speech or of wisdom, declaring unto you the testimony of God. For I determined not to know anything among you, save Jesus Christ and Him crucified. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. And my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power. That your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Howbeit we speak wisdom among them that are perfect. Yet not the wisdom of this world, nor of the princes of this world that come to naught. But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, even the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the world unto our glory, which none of the princes of this world knew. For had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. But as it is written, I hath not seen nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. Now, fathers, we meet together tonight. Please meet with us. Please take the word of God, ground us firmly in your word and your perfect will for the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. Have your way in our lives tonight, for we ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, let's review some of the preliminaries. If you get this and you have them down pat, you'll know more about 1 Corinthians than 95% of professing Christendom. I mean, at least you'll know the basics of the book, so as you read it, you know what's going on. The human author of the book is who? Paul, oh, very good. Remember, God is the author of the book, but he used Paul here in getting the book to us. The Holy Spirit of God used him for holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. It was written about what year? A.D. 55. And it was written from where? Ephesus. And it was written to who? The Church of God. That's very good. So let's try it again. I'm not going to help you so much. The author of the book is who? Very good. Written about what year? A.D. And written from where? Ephesus. And written to who? The Church of God and the theme of the book is what? Unity. All right. The theme of the book is what? Unity in holiness. And the key verse is found in chapter 1 and verse what? 10. Let's all find it. We're going to read it out loud together, young and old alike. 1 Corinthians 1.10. Now I beseech you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that ye all speak the same thing, and that there be no divisions among you, but that ye be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. And remember, as we study these epistles, remember that Paul expected the people that he was writing to to understand what he was writing to them about. They were to get it. They didn't have to do a deep, long Bible search to understand what the main motivation was or the main things that the Apostle Paul was saying to them. A lot of times we think that people got to have a theological degree at some seminary in order to understand these things. What you need to do is understand he wrote it to the redeemed. He wrote it to save people. And they were expected to get it. That's an amazing statement in verse 10. He says, I beseech you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing and that there be no divisions among you. Has that ever been the case in any church? Well, I'm sure it has been from time to time. Unfortunately, it doesn't often stay that way. Matter of fact, hardly ever just stays that way. Because churches do have a life of their own. And do you realize the makeup of the church is not just dependent on the fact that you keep the gospel straight and right, but 
it'll make a big difference on whether or not the membership stays right with God. If the membership doesn't stay right with God, then there's open to all sorts of problems. Now, in our outline of the book, you remember the first nine verses of the book is the what? The introduction. Let's try that again. The first nine verses of the book is the what? The introduction. And then beginning in chapter 1 and verse 10 and on through chapter 4, he deals with the first problem. And this is an important one because if you don't get this one taken care of, nothing else is going to be as it should. There are going to be problems. So the first major problem he deals with is what? Division. Division. All right, you're doing good. So this is the first problem that Paul attacks. And it is born out of carnality. For instance, he says in chapter 3 and verse 3, For ye are yet carnal, for whereas there is among you envying and strife and division, are ye not carnal and walk as men? You see, he had just reminded them as he started out this section, saying how we're to be saying the same things, we're to be speaking the same thing, no divisions among us, perfectly joined together and all that. He then goes into, since their problem was a type of preacher worship, And somehow, if you love this preacher more than you love that preacher, that made you more spiritual or less spiritual, depending on which one that you like. So in the remainder of chapter 1, he told them that the object of their faith was Christ. The the, the basis of their faith faith was Christ's death on the cross. Uh, That we were not identified with any preacher when we got baptized, but we were identified with Christ in our baptism. Not only that, the gospel that was preached to us was not Paul's gospel. It was not Peter's gospel. It was the gospel of Christ, which is the power of God unto salvation. It was Christ who had saved them. There wasn't any man that had saved them. There wasn't a pastor that had saved them. It was Christ that had saved them. And the power in their preaching was Christ. He says the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved, it is the power of God. And he reminded them, it's not by wisdom, it's not by oratory, it's not by any of those things uh, that people get saved. We are to be proclaimers of the gospel of Christ, but it's not done in some kind of great, fantastic wisdom. It's to be done in the power of God, with the power of the gospel and the power of the Holy Spirit of God. So he reminded us again after in verse 18 when he says, For the preaching of the cross to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved, it is the power of God. He reminded us as to what he used to convict men of sin and of righteousness. That it's not somebody with a great deal of talent, uh, oratory, uh, uh, let's say oratorical ability, or anything like that, it has all to do with the fact that God takes the base and he confounds the world. He takes the foolish and confounds the wise. He takes the weak things and he confounds the mighty so that we don't get glory, but that Christ gets glory in everything. Now, after laying that groundwork, we get into chapter 2. And in chapter 2, he goes into how he acted when he went to them, that he had made up his mind that it was not Paul that was going to get the glory, but it was Christ that was going to get the glory, and he stuck very, very close to simply just proclaiming the gospel of Christ. I want you to notice we we'll have three different things that we'll say about this. First of all, it's not man's power, but God's power in the first five verses. And then it's not man's wisdom, but God's wisdom in the next six verses. And then finally, we're going to close out the thing with it's not the flesh, but it is the Spirit of God that does the work. We've got to get a hold of this. This is a spiritual work. In a lot of our Bible colleges, we spend a lot of time on teaching people how to parse all the different genders and tenses and all kinds of stuff like that, how to put a sermon together and how to alliterate those sermons so we really seem like we are really smart people. But for a great work to be done, it's not in all of that. Now listen, I learned stuff like that and I haven't forgotten it. I still use it as I preach from time to time with those things, but it's still got to be the Spirit of God dealing with the heart of man, and the message is not what's going to be great. What's got to be great is Christ. He's the one that must be lifted up, and people must be one to Him. So first of all, in the first five verses, not man's power, but God's. Notice, he says in verse 1, And I, brethren, 
When I came to you, came not with excellency of speech or of wisdom, declaring unto you the testimony of God. Now notice this, how, how on purpose Paul was about this. He says, for I determined not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ and him crucified. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling and my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and of power that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. So Jesus Christ and him crucified, simple message. Now, although, yes, I'm for the study of apologetics, the defense of the gospel and all that, but I remember going to Bible college and we learned all kinds of arguments to deal with those, for instance, who argued for evolution. And we would give a teleological argument. And then there was the anthropomorphic argument. We had all kinds of different arguments that we could give people. Well, you know, I'm sorry. Those things are good for you to know. And I think they're more for the believer and the young believer. But for the lost, they need Christ and Him crucified. That's what it gets down to. They just need Christ and Him crucified. Now, it's interesting that Paul is making this statement for the Corinthians. Do you remember when Paul was on his missionary tour where he went to Corinth? Do you remember where he was at before that? He was at Athens. Now, I want you to turn over for a moment to Acts chapter 17. Now, before he got to Athens, you'll remember when he uh, crossed over into Europe, he went to Philippi, he got a church started at Philippi, he went to Thessalonica, he got a church started in Thessalonica, he went to Berea, remember those people were more honorable than those in Thessalonica because they searched the scriptures daily to see if those things were so, evidently he got a church started there, but he got to Athens and he didn't get a church started there. Now here, that was the biggest city. It was a famous city. Now we have the record of Paul preaching on Mars Hill in Acts chapter 17. I want you to notice some, some things about this message. It says, then Paul stood, verse 22, then Paul stood in the midst of Mars Hill and said, ye men of Athens, I perceive that in all things ye are too superstitious. For I passed by and beheld your devotions, I found an altar with this inscription to the unknown God, whom therefore ye ignorantly worship. Him declare I unto you. So he starts out, he's not giving scripture like we find in many of Paul's messages to begin with. He's laid himself a good introduction for the message right here. He says, you see that idol you've got over there to the unknown God? Well, that one you don't know, that's the one I'm going to tell you about. Now he's basically saying all these other gods are false gods, although he didn't put that into words. And then he gives background. Doesn't quote the Old Testament scripture, and Paul surely knew it. But he says, God that made the world and all things therein, seeing that he is Lord of heaven and earth, dwelleth not in temples made with hands, neither is worshiped with men's hands, as though he needed anything, seeing he giveth to all life and breath and all things. Now everything he's saying is true. He's not saying anything falsely. But he's starting with these Greeks at Athens, not starting with them from the Old Testament scripture and the presentation of scripture of God, but going into the argument of this unknown God, the one that they didn't know, that who he was, notice verse 26, and hath made of one blood all nations of men for to dwell on the face of the earth and hath determined the times before appointed and the bounds of their habitations. Uh, by the way, let me just throw in here, all souls matter. All souls matter. And any other statement will be a racist statement. All souls matter. It has nothing to do with the color of the skin. It has to do with their blood. He's made them all of one blood. How about that? Well, let's move on that they should seek the Lord, if haply they might feel after him and find him, though he be not far from every one of us, for in him we live and move and have our being, as certain also of your own prophets have said, for we are also his offspring. Then he says, for as much then as we are the offspring of God, we ought not to think that the Godhead is like unto gold or silver or stone, graven by art and men's device and the times of this ignorance God winked at, but now commandeth all men everywhere to repent. Everything he's saying is true. 
Everything he is saying is right, but unlike at his other places, we don't find him going to the scripture. This is interesting. Now, he goes on then to say, because he hath appointed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he hath ordained and hath given assurance unto all men in that he hath raised him from the dead. Now, I know when you talk about the resurrection, that assumes somebody had to die. But he didn't say anything about the Son of God dying. Did you notice that? What happens? Now, you can assume he is mentioning the death of Christ, sort of, but he's dealing with resurrection. So notice the result of this message. And when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked, others said, we will hear thee again of this matter. So Paul departed from among them. Howbeit certain, clay, certain men clave unto him and believed, among the which was Dionysius the Areopagite, and a woman named Damaris, and others with them. But he doesn't start a church there. There's no later letter to the Athenians or anything like that. So he leaves this capital city of Greece, and he travels over to Corinth. He's not being run out of town like he had been run out of Thessalonica, like the problems he had had at Berea. He's not being run out of town. He leaves there, even though they said they'd come and hear him again. And when he gets to Corinth and he sees the idolatry of Corinth, he sees the wickedness of Corinth, he says, I made up my mind. My message is Christ crucified. I'm not going to go into all this background stuff and try to wow you with my knowledge of God, but I had one message for you folks, and here's how your church got started. I determined not to know anything among you save Christ crucified. He came with that in his heart. Now, I personally believe that's because of the lack of success that he had in getting a church started in Athens. It's why he made it very plain. And by the way, he wanted to see God move, not his argument, not his um, uh, apologetic on who God is. He wanted to see God move with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, illustrations are nice, and it's good when we have our theological ducks all in a row. We have all our great explanations, but it is the gospel of Christ that is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. And notice also how he came. He says in verse 3, And I was with you in meek weakness and in fear and in much trembling. Now the record of his time going to Corinth is in Acts chapter 18. And if you'll notice in Acts chapter 18, beginning in verse 9, the Bible says this, Then spake the Lord to Paul in the night by a vision, Be not afraid, but speak, and hold not thy peace, for I am with thee, and no man shall set on thee to hurt thee, for I have much people in this city. And he continued there a year and six months. Now, in light of what had happened at Athens, the Lord evidently decided Paul needed some extra encouragement. He was down somewhat. And the Lord showed up and told him, You don't need to be afraid. Be not afraid, but speak. Hold not thy peace. It makes you wonder. Was he thinking, you know, this isn't working so well with these Greeks. Could that have been what he was thinking? God said, no, you go ahead and preach. And he ended up staying there the longest he had stayed any place up to this point. He's there 18 months getting this church started. And then he makes the point, not with enticing words, not with great oratory, Two men went to England to hear some of the great preachers of their day back in the latter part of the 1800s. And uh, they went to hear this one great preacher, and I'm not going to give their names. You would recognize uh, the names if I gave them, but the names are not important for the story. Uh, but when they left the first man, they said, man, what a great preacher. What a great preacher. They went to hear the second man. And when they left the auditorium that night, they said, what a great message. What a fantastic message. And then they went to hear the third man, and when they left the church that day, they were saying, what a great Christ. I've heard a lot of tremendous messages in my life, but I'll tell you the ones that make the biggest difference are the ones that make Christ real to you. 
You know, I guess that's one of the reasons why uh, the message by um, Joe Arthur when he first came to Madison Baptist Church back in, I think it was 2002, and he preached on the one who was leaning on Jesus' breast. Yes, it was a tremendous message, but I'll tell you what, when he was done preaching, you just wanted to be close to Jesus. To be able to just lean upon him and just love him, it was tremendous. Why did he preach like he did? Why did Paul just decide it wasn't going to be great at oratory? He was just going to give them the truth. I'm reminded of a comic strip. I don't even think that it's drawn anymore today. But some of you may remember it. It was The Born Loser. And in The Born Loser, the distinguished professor is giving a lecture. And he says, as he stands before the people, he says, Therefore, putting it into layman's terms... And then he said, hmm, I don't really know any layman's terms. Well, here's the thing. If a preacher or soul winner expects to communicate, it is necessary for him to know some layman's terms. The theological degree doesn't help you with making Christ real. Just need biblical layman's terms. I, I got news for you. You know, it's kind of fun to say soteriological sometimes. And it's fun to talk about pneumatology sometimes. And, and it's fun to talk about eschatological arguments. And those words in $1.57 used to be able to get you a large cup of coffee at McDonald's. I don't know how much it costs today. But those words don't impress anybody. They just simply confuse. Oh, you'll have a few people say, hey, he's been to college. Well, if that's your goal, Congratulations. You've met your goal of people thinking you've got a higher education. But it's not about that. It's turning all sinners to Jesus Christ. So that's what he was doing. And secondly, notice it's not with man's wisdom. In other words, it's not with our great oratory. And it's not with man's wisdom beginning in verse 6. He says, how be it we speak. You notice he went from I to we. And he says, how be it. We speak wisdom among them that are perfect, yet not the wisdom of this world, nor are the princes of this world that come to naught. But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, even the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the world unto our glory, which none of the princes of this world knew. For had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. That hidden wisdom, the, the ageless truths that never change, and aren't blown about by uh, the different uh, theological paths of the day. And he says, that way he gets the glory. It is important that we get down the wisdom of God is above all. There's a message I've preached it all over the country and in several foreign countries too uh, that I entitled, If I'd Only Known. If I'd Only Known. And it had to do with this matter of knowing the wisdom of God. He makes, to me, one of the most interesting statements when he says in verse 8, For none of, this princes, none of the princes of this world knew, for had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. Had they understood the wisdom of God, they wouldn't have crucified Jesus. Now that's interesting. But you see, the world has the wisdom of the world. But the world doesn't have the wisdom of God. And it's the wisdom of God that is needed. You know, the wisdom of the, wisdom of the world says, well, you've got to put your family first. Wisdom of God says, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. The wisdom of man says, you, you need to build yourself up. The wisdom of God says, you've got to humble yourself. You know, the wisdom of man says all kinds of things that are absolutely backwards and wrong. It is the wisdom of God where you find truth. And, these, and the world doesn't get that. They don't know that. They're brought up on the wisdom of man. In verse 9, notice he says, But as it is written, I have not seen nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for them that love him. Here he's talking about the Bible. I have not seen. We have, we have a much more, we have a much better witness than eyewitness. We've got the eternal word of God. They tell us today, even in, even in trials, in criminal trials, having an eyewitness, so many times eyewitnesses are so unreliable. 
Matter of fact, they can have five people see exactly the same thing and have five different descriptions as to what took place. And many times eyewitnesses have been wrong in who they pointed the finger to for being guilty. Eyewitness is not the best of witnesses. They have the best witness. That's the word of God, never wrong. It's always right about everything. He says, nor ear heard. This book is not made up of, well, somebody said. This is what God says. This is his book. I mean, I've met a lot, some smart people. I've met some people I've just been thinking, wow, those guys are brilliant on numbers of things. But I don't care how brilliant they seem to be. And, and they speak with authority. Hey, how many experts have we heard from during this pandemic? How did they ever get the term expert applied to them? And they have been wrong. Even the most famous expert, Dr. Fauci, has been wrong over and over again. He's had to change what he has said several times. Experts, and they're the ones that we are allowing to disrupt the life of every American. The so-called experts. Doesn't give you a lot of faith in human experts, does it? But we do have the word of God, which is true from beginning to end. And he says, nor entered. In other words, this is not Paul's interpretation of what the Old Testament is saying. He's saying this is the truth. For holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. And all scripture is given by inspiration of God. So Paul didn't come to these people because he was so brilliant that he'd be able to wow these people with his oratory and his ability and his smarts and the things that he had seen and his resume as to the things he had done. As a matter of fact, when he writes to the Philippians in Philippians chapter 3, he says of all those things, he says, I count them but dung that I might win Christ. It's wonderful to have an education. By the way, God's not impressed with our education. He's not also impressed with our ignorance. I do believe in preparing ourselves as the best we can. But if you get prepared beyond the place where you start trusting into your ability to get things done, then you are not over prepared. You're not prepared at all. If we could just get people to realize it's going to have to come from God, God is going to have to work. Verse 10, but God hath revealed them unto us by his spirit, for the spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. Either he has or he hasn't. Either God has done this or he hasn't. The spirit of God has either done that with the writers of the word of God or he hasn't. One or the other, you can't have it both ways. This can't be partially the Word of God. It's either all or it's none. I mean, if it's partially the Word of God, which part? You wouldn't have any idea which part. It'd be all based on what part do we like. But searching out God, the infinite one, the one in His great power and wisdom, created all that is with the word of His mouth, created all that is out of nothing. He's the one that did that somehow. We think that a guy sitting in a wheelchair who's suffering from disease that can't be healed, that he knows all the depths of the universe forever? Man, we've got a strange way of picking people who we're going to trust. We've got the Word of God here. The Bible says this in Romans eleven thirty three 33 and 34. Oh, the depths of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are His judgments and His ways past finding out. For who? hath known the mind of the Lord, or who hath been his counselor? Well, the Spirit of God knows the mind of the Lord, and he has revealed it to us in his word. For he says in verse 11, For what man knoweth the things of a man, save the spirit of man which is in him? Even so, the things of God knoweth no man, but the Spirit of God. And I'll just say it again. Holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. Now, what's it, why is he dealing with all this? These people are divided over men. How foolish can you get? You're divided over men. And every one of those men, whether it be Cephas, or whether it be Paul, or whether it be Apollos, who did they preach? Peter didn't preach Peter. Paul didn't preach Paul. They preached Christ. You know, men get all askew. They hear somebody... 
quote something that sounds cool on an internet blog and that guy is now their hero and they follow everything he says or everything that the guy that they quoted says and they end up getting into all kinds of problems. So then he makes the point. It is not the flesh, but it is the spirit. For he goes on to say in verse 12, Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God. I want you to turn back to the book of John. First of all, John chapter 14. John chapter 14. Notice verse 26. He says in John 14, well, let me, let me start at verse 17. Verse 17, he says, Even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him, but ye know him, for he dwelleth in you and shall be in you. This is Jesus talking on the night before the crucifixion. He's telling the disciples he's going to send another comforter. Even the Spirit of truth. You get down to verse 26. But the comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name. He shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I have said unto you. Now you go over to chapter 16. Still the night before the crucifixion. Jesus still teaching them about the Spirit of God. He says in verse 13, How be it when He, the Spirit of truth, is come, He will guide you into all truth. For he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak. He will show you things to come. Now get this, verse 14. He shall glorify me, for he shall receive of mine and shall show it unto you. So the Spirit of God gives us the wisdom of God. He's the one who teaches us understanding of the Scripture to put those eternal truths together in right and righteousness. It is the Spirit of God that we must lean on even as we read our Bible. But who does the Spirit of God lift up? Jesus Christ. It's all about Christ. You know, you look, pardon me, at a lot of the charismatic churches and Pentecostal churches, all they talk about is the Spirit. It's the Spirit this, Spirit that. Listen, when the Spirit, if you're having a Holy Ghost meeting, it's Christ that's being lifted up. People are being one to Jesus Christ if you're having a real Holy Ghost meeting. That's what he does. Now, since we have the Holy Spirit of God living within us, man, we got the author of the book right here. And he will teach us. He's not going to teach you everything at one time. Your brain would explode. That couldn't happen. So no, wait, he goes on. Notice he says, verse 13, Which things also we speak, not in the words which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. These things are true spoken of God. They're God's truths. It reaffirms that these things were given by God. Divine inspiration claimed that we are, uh, that we are taught by the Holy Spirit of God. And that's the way we're to teach. By the way, you're a Sunday school teacher. You need to make sure you're filled with the Holy Spirit when you teach a class. I mean, Really? It's not your brilliance at teaching the Sunday school class. When we preach, we need to understand. We want to make Jesus Christ clear to people. And we need to depend on him. Now you say, well, preacher, if all that's true, why do you yell so much? Because I'm a yeller. That's me. And I've covered that some last week when we were dealing with this. People have different styles in their preaching. I don't do it to bowl you over. I just like yelling. I like shouting it from the housetop. Amen. I believe the word of God ought to be preached with conviction and sound like it. But the truth is he's made some people quiet because there's some folks their ears hurt if you get too loud. I reckon. But, but notice he goes on to say, which things also we speak, not in words which man's wisdom teaches, but which the Holy Ghost teaches, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. But the natural man receiveth not the things concerning the Spirit, or not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him, neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. Now, a lost man, he, he'll look at something and say, well, I, I, don't, I don't get that, I don't see that there. Well, of course, he's lost. 
That there's one thing a lost man needs to know. Well, actually, there are a couple things. He needs to know he's lost. He needs to know who Jesus is. He needs to know what Jesus did. And he needs to know what Jesus will do if he'll trust him. That's what a lost man needs to know. Uh, I can remember several years ago, uh, John Morris' son, and I can't remember his first name. His name might have been John too. They were looking for the ark over at Mount Ararat. And they put a film together. And they, and they came out very blatant. I was really kind of surprised because these people should have known better than this. I don't have any doubt they were believers and good men and all of that looking for the ark. But, but they said, when people come to the realization that the ark is real, it'll turn thousands upon thousands to Christ. Why? Why would that turn thousands? If a man coming back from the dead to witness to the rich man's brothers wouldn't turn people to Christ, then seeing a piece of wood that's pretty big is not going to turn people to Christ either. The gospel of Christ is the power of God unto salvation. Whether, you know, the ark doesn't have to be there for me to believe that it was. God said it. That settles it for me. And it was made out of material that came from the earth. So guess what was going to happen? It was going to decay. We were looking at one of these um, discovery shows the other night. And they were talking about how this mountain range over here is 330 million years older than the range right next to it. What, did it fall from outer space? How did that happen? How did it get older? It all got here at the same time. Oh, well, that's according to carbon-14, which is only good for about 7,000 years. That's all it's really good for. Well, we know, no, you don't know anything, man. Just take what God says in his word, and that ought to be enough. But here's the thing when it comes to the script, the natural man doesn't receive those things. The natural man can receive facts. He can receive the fact from the scripture that Jesus was born in Bethlehem, that Jesus died on a cross. He can even accept the fact that Jesus rose from the dead and still be lost. He can get that. He's not going to get the other stuff, though, until he gets born again. I've told you this story several times. When I was young, probably about 10 or 11 years old, I was out at my grandma and grandpa's farm, and I was thinking, you know, I need to, I probably ought to read a Bible sometime. And they had an old Bible in the bookshelf. I don't know why. I'd never seen it out there at the house. I don't know that anybody ever read it. Just I think back then most everybody at least had a Bible in the house. You didn't have to be saved to have a Bible in the house. And so I remember getting it out, sitting down in the chair, and I began to read. Well, when you open it up, where are you going to read first? Well, let's see. Probably be better if I started in the New Testament. I don't know why I thought that. You know, lost people think all kinds of dumb things when later after they get saved they don't know why they were thinking what they were thinking. And yeah, I read the book of the generations of Jesus Christ, the son of uh, da Abraham, the son of David. And Abraham begat Isaac, and Isaac begat Jacob, and Jacob begat Judah and his brethren. I'm not going to go through that whole spiel. And I got down to probably about verse 14, and I thought, who wants to read this? And I closed it up, put it back in the bookshelf, and didn't read the scripture again, as far as I know, until... I started going to church to play softball with the church team. But after I got saved, after I got saved, I opened up the Bible to Matthew chapter 1. It's amazing how clear it was. That is a lie. There's a reason that I memorized the entire first chapter of the book of Matthew. I memorized it because there are so many precious truths in that long line of names. It is a living line. First of all, it's the genealogy of my Savior. But when you see what is in the genealogy of that, you've got Gentile women involved in this. They were in the line too. And being a Gentile, that means a lot to me as well. Hey, Jesus came into the world to die for sinners. You've got the virgin birth in that as well. Of whom was born Jesus? The, the um, husband of Mary. No, that's not right. Uh, I, I lost the verse. It's chapter, seven, chapter 1, verse 18. But anyway... But you see all those things in the line, and you say, wow, this is tremendous. 
with how he was named, with the virgin birth and all of that that follows that, and how the record must be true because it was all there for people to see. He was in the right line. Nobody else could have had that. This is fantastic. The book is alive. As a lost person, meant nothing to me. I got saved, and the book became alive. After I got saved, I read through my New Testament at least three times, I think it was five times, in the next three months. I just wanted to know more about him, know more about him. After five times, I decided, you know, it's time I go back to the Old Testament and start reading the Old Testament through. Just love the book. What a great book it is. Now, here's the key with this. And he goes on to say, but he that is spiritual judgeth all things. Now, wait just a moment. We need to understand the rules of interpreting the Scripture. First of all, as I said earlier, when Paul wrote it, he wrote it for it to be understood by the Corinthians. While they said that, when he wrote the book of Galatians, the Galatians were expected to understand what he was writing. He wasn't trying to hide something from them. He was trying to reveal truths to them. And that's exactly what he did. But interpreting Scripture, it always has to go according to context. The cults are real good at taking bits and pieces of verses, pulling them out of context, and making them say things that they don't even say. I could prove to you from the Bible that the Bible says there is no God. That is an exact quote. But it is not teaching there is no God. The Bible says the fool has said in his heart there is no God. See, it's teaching there is a God and only a fool doesn't believe in God according to the Scripture. Uh, when it says in the book of Ephesians, let him that stole steal. That's an exact quote. That gives you the idea then that if you were a thief before you got saved, it's all right to continue to be a thief because after all, you've got to feed your family. No, that's not what it's saying at all. It says that him that stole, steal no more, but rather let him labor working with his hands. You've got to take things in context. And you always, when somebody brings a verse to you and says, uh, explain that to me, because that doesn't seem to be what we believe. Read the verses before and the verses after. Put them all together in context and Almost all the time, it'll be pretty clear. You won't have trouble with it. And people normally get in trouble when they just take bits and pieces of it out of context. So the natural man doesn't understand those things because he's spiritually dead. These things can only be judged by those that are spiritual. I was reading about the old telegraph wires, you know, when you'd have the telegraph wires, they said if you were underneath those telegraph wires fairly close, you could hear a sound that almost sounded like a musical instrument as the messages were going down the telegraph line. But you know, no man could understand, no matter how important the message might have been, it had a sound. But you didn't know if it was a happy message, a tragic message, a long message. You didn't know really what it was because you weren't tuned in to the frequency you needed the telegraph in order to do that. Charles Spurgeon said that when a traveler was newly arrived in the Alps, he's constantly deceived in his reckoning. And he talked about a traveler that they had traveled with to the central part of Switzerland. And there was a place called the Rigi, a mountain massive of the Alps, only about 6,000 feet high. That's not super duper high. Obviously, there's some Alps that are a lot higher than that. Um, but he told the people, he said, you know, I think I can get up there in about, in about an, half an hour. Definitely no more than an hour. Four hours later, he was still panting and still far away. Now, if you've ever driven out west, I mean, after all, we've lived over here around the Appalachians, you know, and these small mountains that we have. Not very big. You go out west, though, driving out west, you'll see these mountains are far off, and you'll think, you know, we'll probably be there in an hour. And you'll drive, and you'll drive, and you'll drive, and you'll drive for hours upon hours it takes you to finally get there. The problem is that your perception is off. And there are a lot of people like that in their study of the Scripture. Unfortunately, their perception is off because they don't get where the things that are coming from. Notice what he says in verse 15. But he that is spiritual judgeth all things. Yet he himself is judged of no man. I thought Christians weren't supposed to judge. Well, here it says he that is spiritual 
judgeth all things. Why? Because we have the wisdom of God in the Scripture. How can we make such a blatant statement like abortion is murder? We've got the Scripture. That's why. How can we say categorically, undeniably, that homosexuality is a sin? Because we've got the Scripture. God hasn't changed his mind. He's the eternal God. And it doesn't make a difference what any poll says. That does not change right and wrong from God. We can make that judgment. All we're doing is simply agreeing with God. They've, how can we say that uh, adultery is wrong? How can we say it's wrong? After all, these, these people committing adultery may be greatly in love with one another. How can you just blanket say that it's wrong? Because the Bible says marriage is honorable and all in the bed undefiled, but adulterers and whoremongers, God will judge. You see, we make our judgment, the spiritual make their judgment on the basis of thus saith the word of God. Well, how can you say that only those who believe the gospel of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ are going to heaven? I mean, what about the Mormons who have a different Jesus? They have a Jesus who is the half-brother to Lucifer, both of them sons of Elohim God. And they have their gospel is another testament of Jesus Christ, the Book of Mormons. How can you say that's wrong? Because I've got the finished word of God right here. And God's word doesn't teach any of those things that these people are teaching about Jesus. They've got a different Jesus. Jehovah's Witnesses have a Jesus who was the Archangel Michael, who became a God. Well, that's not the Jesus of the Bible. How can we say, man, they're not going to heaven? How can we say that? Because there's only one way to heaven, and that's through the Jesus who died for our sins on Calvary's cross, was buried, rose three days later from the dead, who is God in the flesh. That's how we can say that. Amen. He that is spiritual judgeth all things. I'm not impugning their character. I'm not attacking them for uh, their false belief. I'm just giving you the truth, and they need the gospel just as every other lost person needs the gospel. I got news for you. Most of the world has believed wrongly about God, and that's why Jesus said, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. And then he says, He that is spiritual judgeth all things, but he himself is judged of no man. For who hath known the mind of the Lord, that he may instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. The reality is, we can't instruct God. His word is final. Uh, we can sit there and say, well, you know, by my human reasoning, I don't agree with God about this. Well, your reasoning's wrong. God is the one who is right. He speaks truth. Jesus said, you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. The very people that would call on folks like us to apologize for making statements about the homosexuals or transgendered people that we do, making the script, we'd be commanded to apologize for saying that. No, I'm just giving you what the Bible says. I'm not going to apologize for what God said. That's why they hate God. Because God ain't apologizing. God's sticking with the truth that he gave. It's not changing. His word is good forever. How foolish it is to follow men. I believe that the Apostle Paul was committed to the truth of God's word so much that he was willing to die for it, which, of course, he did. Now, the secret things belong unto the Lord our God, but the things which are revealed belong unto us and to our children forever, that we may do all the words of this law. The reality is, when I see things that I don't get yet, it doesn't really bother me. I'll know about it someday when God's ready for me to know it. Right now, I'm to be concerned with the things that are clearly given, and I can know. Things that are hard to be understood, I'll try to understand them. I'll do my best to understand them. But if I still don't get it, that's okay. It doesn't change his truth. He's always right. So here's the church divided over men. He said, what is wrong with you people? It is all about Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Father, we come to you in the name of the Lord Jesus. We do pray you'll take the word of God and that you would deal with hearts. There's one listening tonight without Christ on the internet. 
We pray that right now where they're at, they fall to their knees and cry out, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I now put my faith and trust in Jesus Christ as my personal Savior. We pray they'd come to the Son of God. Lord, we do pray that you'll bless in the business meeting that we have to follow. And we'll thank you for what you do. Lead us, we pray, in Jesus' name. Amen.